Hello and welcome to the 22nd in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of longevity and I'll be examining some of the claims that young earth creationists make about extraordinarily old characters in the Bible stories of Genesis. In particular in this presentation I'll be looking at a number of claims made in the presentations of the infamous young earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means that I won't be covering the whole topic and I won't even be covering it in any sensible order. I'll just cover the topics that Hovind himself mentions. So let's get started. The Bible claims extraordinary ages for the first few fathers of the tribes of Israel, generally well into the 900s. For example, Adam, the first man, allegedly died at the ripe old age of 930 years. Methuselah, the oldest man who ever lived, allegedly, lived to 969. And Noah died aged 950 after surviving a flood that never happened. The concept that these are actually truthful values is clearly nonsense. How can we rationalise it? Maybe they just scaled the values by a large factor. Even Hovind himself points out that it's invalid to apply a scale factor to these ages, say by assuming that they meant months, not years, because that would mean that these patriarchs had children when they were still prepubescent. For comparison, the oldest ever human being died at aged 129. His name was Habib Mian. There's a picture of him on this slide. According to Genesis, Noah was nearly 600 years old when he built the ark. I ask you to contemplate whether or not there is any process as yet unknown to science, but somehow known to primitive people from the Bronze Age, which could cause a man to age so slowly that he would be fit enough to do intensive manual labour when aged more than four times as old as this sprightly young gentleman. Bear in mind that the oldest people we know about today are taken from a population of seven billion, not a few million or fewer who would have been alive when Noah allegedly lived, according to the myth. This is with modern medicine, abundant food and running water on tap, and all the other niceties of the modern world. Archaeology has something to say here too. Archaeological records of individuals who died in the Bronze Age, around 5000 BCE, show that most died before reaching their 30s, and to reach what we would currently call retirement age, say 60, was basically unheard of. Yet the Bible says that every single one of the patriarchs, bar one, lived into their 900s, and the one who didn't, that was Lamech, died aged 777, a particularly auspicious number as far as biblical numerology is concerned. Not a single one of these men died from disease, and every single one exceeded modern ages by a factor of more than 10. Really? I think not. There is no problem here, the Bible is simply wrong. To anyone thinking rationally, the claims that people lived to exceptional ages in a time where people lived in filthy mud huts swimming in sewage is as big a sign as any that the biblical stories from the Pentateuch were just creative fiction and legend. The idea of a vapour canopy is an attempt to explain both the longevity of the patriarchs and also the origin of the water of the biblical flood. However, it fails on both grounds. Firstly, of course, it's impossible. There is no way to keep that amount of water up in the atmosphere. Our atmospheric system is nicely stable, and whenever the atmosphere is saturated, it simply rains. Secondly, it's unbiblical. Enough water up there to make a difference would have been enough to blot out the stars permanently, for example, though the Bible clearly states that there were stars. For example, Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. Thirdly, that much water would block out harmful radiation, but would also block out vital sunlight, leading to the failure of crops and a permanently dark earth, not to mention the problems that would be caused by a lack of sunlight, such as vitamin D deficiency. Fourthly, of course, there's a lot of other reasons why people die that have nothing whatsoever to do with harmful radiation, such as diseases, physical injury, infection, organ failure, etc. According to Hovind, before the flood, oxygen levels in the atmosphere would have been much higher. Of course, there's no evidence for this, though there were some periods in the Earth's history, such as the Carboniferous period from 360 to 300 million years ago, which had much higher oxygen levels than today, allowing for enormous insects to grow. There's no reason why the vapour canopy would have caused this effect. However, unless Hovind is claiming that it compressed the entire atmosphere, but there's no reason why that would increase the amount of oxygen relative to the other gases. And we can check what the levels of oxygen were like over the history of the Earth by looking at isotope ratios in various rocks. And we know that oxygen levels have remained rather constant for hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions. Besides, excess oxygen wouldn't have helped. If anything, studies show that people who live at high altitudes, where the oxygen levels are lower, live longer than those of us who live close to sea level. Why didn't ages suddenly drop after the flood? 
Hovind claims that the main factors keeping people alive were the vapour canopy, which blocks out harmful rays, though as I've showed it would block out all sunlight, and the enhanced oxygen levels that he claims were somehow present in the pre-flood world. However, though ages did drop slightly after the flood, the Bible says that people continued to live for 300 or 400 years even after this alleged canopy disappeared. For example, Noah, who was 600 years old when the floods came, still managed to live another 350 years afterwards, somehow. How did they do that? For a start, if they were used to extra dense air with a high oxygen content, then they would have had a tough time breathing in this new earth. And their skin would be so pale from years with low sunlight that they would have caught skin cancer very easily. Unless, of course, the ages were fictional. As I said earlier, this is the only rational possibility available to us. Hovind talks about the Hunza people, who are a real tribe who live in the mountains of northern Pakistan. He mentions that they tend to live for extraordinary lengths of time, and aren't in the Guinness Book of Records only because they don't have good birth records. However, we have no reason whatsoever to believe that lifespans could be considerably increased over those that we see in the Western world, by virtue of diet or lifestyle. If this were possible, then out of the hundreds of millions of rich people in the Western world, surely somebody would have found the secret by now, and would be chalking up their 200th year, say. Or, more importantly, they would be selling the secrets of whatever they found, and there would be countless 200 or 300 year old pensioners busily running marathons or swimming across the Mediterranean. Of course, the reason why people aren't living to great ages is because the human body simply isn't capable of it. It's not built to live that long. The reason why the Hunza people say that they're over 100 years old is that they're lying, or otherwise confused. They claim great ages mainly to impress tourists. In fact, studies show that they live on average around 52 to 53 years, just as we would expect. That's still quite impressive for a primitive tribe, and we can chalk some of that up to healthy, peaceful lifestyle, but it's hardly superhuman. Also, author John Clark stayed among the Hunza people for nearly two years in the 1950s, and reported in his book Hunza, Lost Kingdom of the Himalayas, that Hunza people not only do not use calendars, but do not consider age to be a purely chronological measure. They also include estimation of wisdom into their ages, leading to extraordinary and fictional ages, at least by Western standards. Also, it's worth reading the conclusion of John Tierney, writing in the New York Times in 1996. Quote, the great Hunza secret to old age turned out to be its absence of birth records. The illiterate elders didn't know how old they were, and they tended to overestimate their ages by a decade or two, as I discovered by comparing their recollections with known historical events. Hunza didn't have an unusual number of centenarians, it turned out, and its traditional way of life was not a formula for good health. End quote. So it turns out that the Hunza people are actually a really good disproof of the Bible stories. They show that even in the 21st century, people can massively distort their own ages for various reasons, and legends can start concerning them in just a few years. Well, that's all for now. As ever, there's loads more information on my website at frame.net, where you can also find a transcript of this talk and all the following ones and all the previous ones, and you can keep up to date with my blog as well as learning about some of my other work. See you next time when I'll be talking about education and Kent Hovind's ideas about how we should be teaching our children. How can we ensure that our children are best placed to thrive in their adult lives? Thanks for listening.